It is so good to hear your voice this morning. Um, we want to welcome our guests to Let's Talk and remind those who uh, have been with us for some time that we got started with the Let's Talk program back in 2002, right? 2007? Oh, I'm getting all confused. We're brought to you by Louisiana Democracy Project, a nonprofit social justice organization dedicated to the community and the best interests of those who live there at large. We invite you to like us, share, and comment, and also subscribe. We look forward to uh, hearing from you. You can click us at talkissues at gmail.com, T-A-L-K-I-S-S-U-E-S -S -S at gmail.com. As I was saying, the um, program is brought to you by Louisiana Democracy Project, and we got started back in 1998. Alicia Garth is uh, our um, chaplain, and she has served well for uh, many years. Uh, God bless and keep her. We look forward today uh, to <clears throat> welcoming our folks at 247praiseradio.com as well as www.wtqt.org. That's uh, WTQT 106.1 FM Baton Rouge. Make sure that you have downloaded the 247praiseradio.com app so that you can uh, get music and messages and inspiration uh, day and night, 24-7, <laughs> wherever you are in the world. We look forward to uh, bringing to you in the second part of our program, our special guest, Mildred Mohammed. Mildred Mohammed is the ex-wife of <clears throat> uh, a man, John Allen Mohammed, who uh, is best known for being the DC sniper, a serial killer who uh, paralyzed uh, part of the nation back in about 2002. We um, are in the midst of all kinds of stuff uh, going on around the world. Uh, many feel that we're on the, uh, the brink of, oh my goodness, World War III as Russia continues to invade the Ukraine. In that scenario, they uh, the Russians have been bombing the Ukraine, um, uh, seeing more firepower than that part of Europe has seen since World War II. <clears throat> the Russians are saying that they are bombing Ukraine to keep out the Nazis, but we're told that that is just a smokescreen. They honestly do not want <clears throat> Ukraine to join NATO. <clears throat> NATO is a peacekeeping force in that part of the world. And um, earlier during the week, we found out that they had bombed a nuclear power plant. Now, for those of you that know anything about uh, nuclear energy, uh, it is a, not only a force that can power lights and switches, but it is a force that can wipe out mankind. Uh, every <clears throat> modern nation that has nuclear power, it's one of its worst nightmares is that there will be a breach, a leak, uh, and it can kill every living thing. And so uh, we go deeply in prayer as... Um, these folks are struggling. Um, the Ukraines for their freedom. Uh, the Russians who, um, like before, want world domination. We know that, uh, and um, they are 
poised in an area that in America we really, really don't know. We, you know, we we don't know what it's like to be totally dominated by the government, where what you say, what you do, where you go, what you wear, uh, is uh, dictated by the government. And I know that there are some who uh, wish that that was the case here, but it is not. In the brink of uh, prayer and feeling really badly for these people and their freedom. Uh, thousands and thousands of refugees are seeking asylum shelter uh, in the one exit area that um, they uh, can flee to in that they are covered by three sides. And um, I think we talked about this a little earlier during the uh, week, uh, Alicia, and that is that even in this in this uh, time of turmoil, uh, that there is racism has reared its uh, nasty head. And I'll let you speak on that a minute. And uh, I know that there are people already in the Ukraine from all over the world, including uh, Nigeria, Liberia. Uh, the Sudan and other places. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Thank you, Stephanie, so much. It's really so much of a problem. You know, it seemed like something should just bring people together to love one another. Yeah. Instead of, I mean, it's not like it's, a, it's ever a time. It may be for a, a week, but then you see in racism, racism. And you know, and that was, and that's a demon from hell. Mm -hmm. That is a prince of Bezebub. That's a demon from hell, and it has no boundaries. It's everywhere. Mm -hmm. You know, and even in our town, which is Baton Rouge, Louisiana, we have racism so bad. Mm -hmm. And I mean, when it seems like when something comes out in the media, Stephanie. It's like it's going to be the same way somewhere else, everywhere else. It's like that demon doesn't, it, it, it's not like, but it's that demon does not care who you are, what you are, it doesn't matter. But Stephanie, you know what, I, I woke up and I weep this morning. I'm weeping all the time, but I'm weeping for souls. God put people in my spirit and, I, and their burdens, you know. Yeah. And Stephanie, you know, and... Like I said, we can talk about Ukraine, everywhere else in the world, but you know what? It's the same all over. Mm. It's the same all over. That's very true. You know, it's uh, unfortunate that black people are hated, uh, people of color are hated all over the world. That's a um, a um, you know, a phenomenon that um, that um, has gotten a grip and held on. Um, next week, I think it is, that will be uh, the anniversary of Bloody Sunday. And uh, that's when um, people tried to cross the Edmund Pettus Bridge in order to go to, uh, reg they were marching for the right to vote. And I can remember when they decided that they were going to change the name from Bloody Sunday to Jubilee. And I thought to myself at the time, I said, you know what? Uh, there are still people fighting for their rights in our democracy. But at the same token, there are folks that think everything is okay, that racism is gone, and that, uh, you know, all we have to worry about is economic things. And so now, um, Congressman John Lewis has, has a, day, uh, 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 a, a bill named after him uh, for the voting rights because at, with the original Bloody Sunday, he was beaten within an inch of his life with billy clubs, with uh, law officers on horseback. Women were trampled. 
uh, as if they were uh, you know, worms. This we always have to be diligent and keep our minds uh, straight because uh, you know this particular phenomenon uh, is all over the world. All over the world, and you know, Stephanie, you know, it's just really awesome that. Uh, the word of God is not a respect the person. That's right. But you know, but then again, I think too about that. Racism was even back then and there mm. in the old covenants. They have racist racism, and not only racism, but they had um, slavery, and so much, so much of a misconception about so much. But you know what? As I was saying, I was woke up weeping this morning. Yeah, and I turned to the scripture. Stephanie, and on the book of Hebrew, 10 and 25. And it said, not forsaking the assembly of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another as so much the more as you say the day approaching. And the day, Stephanie, is approaching now. Mm -hmm. it's, it's been approaching. Yeah. Stephanie, I, want, I want to read this right here, and then I want, I'm going to talk about what I'm going to talk about. In 1 John 4 and 7, Stephanie, it says, Beloved, let us, let us love one another, for he is love. Mm -hmm. Love is of God, and everyone that loveth is born of God and knoweth God. He that loveth not knoweth God, for God is love. In this was manifest the love of God toward us, because that God's sent his only begotten son into the world that we may live through him you know what I, and i want everybody to just go on and read that all the way down to 25 but i need to talk about it because i don't want to really go on our time i know we had a lot to cover this morning but you know uh some, some time ago the lord allowed me to meet these beautiful women of god you know because i needed help with what i needed to help with stephanie and you know what i'm not ashamed to say because we overcome the devil by the blood of the Lamb and the words of our testimony. And I was allowed to go to an event and I met one of these miraculous ladies. One of these ladies that, were, that fight for black, not only black, but brown for people, period. Mm -hmm. But you know what, Stephanie, we got this young man and he was killed. And how the law enforcement did, the law enforcers did this was, I mean, you could. That was here in Louisiana. Uh -huh. That was here in Louisiana. Here in Louisiana, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Okay. <laughs> in our own back door. Mm -hmm. So, see, we're not excluding. I don't care where you go. Mm -hmm. It will find you. It will find you. But this young man, which was, a, which is a twin, got a twin brother. Mm -hmm. And the one that got gotten killed was named Dion. So I called my, this other lady that I met, one of these uh, phenomenal ladies, and I want to help because I'm looking for something in particular. And I mean, you can go all around Baton Rouge and you're not going to find it. We got black people, listen to me well. We have to stand up because if we don't love each other, who is going to love us? Mm. No one. If we don't stand up and love and fight for one another, who is going to do it? And that's nobody. But at 12 o'clock this afternoon in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at the Woodlawn High School, and the address is 15755 Jefferson Highway, and the, and the zip code is 70807. Because you know what? This was not done right. That's not a new thing. What's done right when it comes to us? So when let's When it comes to us, what's done right? You know I got to ask you. Um, a little bit more detail, you know, who, uh, how old was this child and what was happening when he got killed? You know what? I don't know the age of him, but I will find out, Stephanie. Okay. You know, but, um, it's a young black youth. He's young, a young black man. He's young. Uh -huh. So I can say maybe, I, I can say maybe this or whatever, but I'm not going to say it. I want to be angry with it. All right. His name is Dion Willis. Uh-huh. When this young man, when they knocked on the door of the apartment, you know what I'm saying? Not, not, you think about Brianna. 
when they knocked on the door of the apartment, it came in shooting. Oh no. The deputy, yeah, and I don't want to get too much because I don't want to, you know, be you a, yeah, um, you want people to go to the meeting. Yeah, go to them because you know what the family, no one has contacted the mother yet. Okay. You hear what I'm saying? Yes. So you know what? They rallying uh, rallying around her and being support for her. And I just want to be supportive and in whatever way I can. So this is new to me. I never really just did an announcement. But you know what? I couldn't even sleep last night because you know what? I have a son and my son is mentally ill. Yes. If it's not the mentally ill you can kill, it's the black you can kill. And I'm not exempting the mothers or, or anybody else or whatever. And I said to you even last night, I said, Stephanie, which one do you think is, is, is number one? The mentally ill of the of this black period. <laughs> Living while black, huh? You know, but it's yeah. still, still black. Yes, yes. It's still black. So this is a phenomenon, not only in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, but you may find the same thing in your hometown, that um, not only is there uh, an epidemic of black on black crime, but there's also an epidemic of um, police uh, and other law enforcement uh, taking uh, black lives uh, and becoming judge, jury, and executioner on the spot. So uh, we want to uh, you encourage you, uh, our listeners, if you are in the Baton Rouge area, to make your way to Wooddale, Woodlawn High School Woodlawn, yes. over in 70807. And uh, for others, uh, if you have someone in the area, let's see if uh, you can't uh, find out by um, the social media uh, what is being discussed exactly in the meeting. And speaking of social media, that was one of the uh, things that they cut off yesterday in... Um, in Russia itself, not in the Ukraine, but in, in Russia itself, so that people can only um, view state radio and uh, government television. And of course, they long ago took over government, uh, the government took over radio and newspapers. And uh, so we want to be happy and keep safe. Uh, those uh, areas of information that we have here in the United States where we're able to get information from around uh, the region, around the nation, and around the world. Uh, let's not take these things for granted. Right, correct. Thank you for uh, tuning in to Let's Talk. Make sure that you uh, put in your comments uh, as uh, we endeavor to not only learn, but distribute information that we think uh, will be uh, interesting and pertinent to you. Alicia, man, yes, oh yeah. man, um, we have uh, been bombarded by um, not only the death toll coming up for, uh, for gunfire, but by suicide. That the, that um, people, especially young people, are figuring that death would be better than life. They are without hope and uh, c deciding that um, death is a, vi a suicide is a viable alternative to uh, the problems that they're facing. I know you might have a word or two to uh, say to that population of citizens who are facing dark, dark days. Yeah, uh, that, you know, God is the giver of life. Whether the police doing it, whether someone doing it, whether you're doing it to yourself, God is the giver of life. Yeah, you may think it's a way out, but it's not. You still have eternal life. Mm -hmm. You know, and it's just, you know, and I mean, that demon, even with that 
that spirit of that of suicide, that demon have you not thinking about your family, your loved ones, your mother, no one. And your future contribution to mankind. Even about the future, God said, I have plans. God said, I have plans. Mm -hmm. And to give you an expected end. So, you know, we are not without hope. But you know what? Others may see it, but you know what? We that's no hope is in the word of God. Hope is there for us because we need that same fellowship as everyone else. You know, when I talk to and, and I and the lady that I talked to her name is Miss Linda Johnson French. This is French. the one that's over the meeting over at Woodlawn in the, yes, regarding yes. the killing. Yes, Miss Linda Johnson Frank and I have a email she sent to me. Mm -hmm. I'm going to get back to what we sent, but it's life l i f e b r p p r c at gmail.com. That's her email address. Yeah, and her name is Miss Linda Johnson Frank. Give me that email one more time. Okay, yes, it's L I F E B R P P R C at gmail.com. You say P P P P R C R C at uh huh gmail.com. All right. Yeah, and, and they're seeking transparency, Stephanie. They want answers. Just like the guy from Monroe who they hear. The mother. Oh, God, Stephanie. <laughs> yes. And let me fill in uh, um, those in the rest of the nation. Uh, here in Louisiana, the state police uh, told a mother that her child, her son, a grown son, have been involved in an accident, a vehicle accident. Uh, they kept trying to get um, information regarding the accident. And finally, after two years, they were able to get information released and found that he had not been involved in a vehicle accident. He had been beaten to death. Um, and that there had been a top to bottom cover up with the state police de department, the local NAACP as well as the state NAACP became involved. Mm -hmm. And uh, the AP Wire Service um, published information saying that the governor of Louisiana had been sent a text in regard to this uh, killing. There's still... Uh, investigation going on uh, regarding how much uh, information the governor knew as well as um, more information on, on how uh, what has happened with the people involved. Some have retired, some are still on the payroll, but not on active duty. It's a montage of um, surprising uh, a, a turn of events. And uh, so this hurt mother is, um, you know, still trying to get to the bottom of what had occurred with her grown son. And of course, the nation saw the execution of Alton Sterling here in Baton Rouge uh, on I think that was North Foster Drive uh, at uh, a convenience store, corner store. And had there not been there, that particular, the surveillance film was uh, confiscated and locked away. But the store owner, who had been a, a, not only an acquaintance, but a friend of uh, Alton, had video that he had done with his phone and uh, was able to release that. And I, I want to just stop just for a moment to say that as I understand it, um, see Denise Marcel, who is now a state representative, but back then was a council person, really pushed for body cameras. In fact, I called her the godmother 
of body cameras in Baton Rouge. It was, she went through a lot. It was very unpopular with the police department, but she found the funding nationally and it prevailed. And um, a lot of things, including the um, information for Mr. Green became available because of uh, body cam. Uh, and so we want to really salute now uh, Denise Marcel, the uh, state representative, uh, for her forethought, her yes. wisdom, and her persistence. Because of that, we know far more than we would otherwise. Yes, indeed. Definitely. And you know, Sister, I just want to acknowledge and thank so much for the NAACP. Because you know what, they got involved. The Branch Hill got involved. Because like I said, the mother didn't receive anything. Now just think if that was your child and he was killed by the police. Mm -hmm. And you had no you no know, transparency. You had no nothing, no conversation, no nothing. Nothing. You just know your child did. Yes. And, you know, and that's one of the things that the, a mother would say, I, I don't want to go before my child. Oh, yeah. We have heard that when it was even when we were kids, you know, and oh my God, just think night after night, day after day, mother not knowing anything. You know, even the uh the kids that you were talking about, even the kids I remember the mother that they found her son in the eight meat reaper. Yeah. The nineteen year old said I think that, that the nineteen year old were found, I think. That yeah. was right from Zachary. Yes. You know, so Stephanie, if we don't, come on now, all these our black babies are dying. Yes. These are people that say that they love God. Mm -hmm. But no, you, you can't love God if you see, you, don't, you, you can't see God. But you see me every day and you can't love me. Mm -hmm. So no, you don't love God. God is love. God is love. Mm -hmm. So I just acknowledge Miss Alexis. Anderson, awesome woman of God that love God and love God's people. Linda Frank, Linda Johnson Frank. Mm -hmm. Oh my God, thank you, Lord. Mm -hmm. Stephanie, you know what? I met Alexis, Reverend Alexis Johnson from the phone. Okay. They were having an evening. We talked so much, not even seeing each other. And I, and I thank God that God has allowed that to happen to me several times of not knowing the people, but they're working with me because they're understanding my pain and they're working with me. Mm -hmm. I call Miss Alexis Anderson almost all the time, and she provided, mm -hmm. provided Ubers for me, different things for me to get me, they help me get help. And I got no help from Baton Rouge concerning my son. Mm -hmm. They will allow our kids to be slaughtered. That's right. Not only in the street, but in your place, in your home. Yeah. Then those demons will have them people coming in. Yeah. Well, mothers, we must stand and um we must stand together. Uh we are the voice of reason, of compassion, of humanity, and uh we uh encourage you to get involved. Put on your mask, get your hand sanitizer, and head over, over to Woodlawn High School to hear what has happened with Dion Willis. Uh, and as you go over there to 70807, we want to encourage you to take your phone with you so that you can post. Now, you know, I, nobody loves posting memes no more than me. I love, I love the little funny jokes. But we certainly must address serious things for the serious times that we live in. Yeah. You, you're tuned to Let's Talk. I'm Stephanie Anthony, your host, along with co-host Alicia Garth. Our very own Maida McDonald is on the road, and we'll look forward to hearing uh, all about what she has encountered uh, in her travels. And hopefully we'll uh, also find out a thing or two from Pastor Cat, who's been on the road as well. Com coming up, we have um, in this hour, our special guest, Mildred Mohammed, um, the 
in 2002, the nation was terrorized by an unknown, unseen threat. Gunfire was uh, going out in the D.C. area, uh, killing people, and the, the body count uh, came up to 10 people. The, the world and the United States was not ready for such a horrendous series of events. Uh, Mildred Mohammed, who is from Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana, was in hiding from her ex-husband, John Allen Mohammed. She was a mother and she had obtained uh, a lifetime restraining order against her ex-husband. Uh, he had threatened to kill her and she knew that he meant it. Well, while the nation was frozen in fear, what they did not realize was that the random killing of the innocent, non-suspecting people was a smokescreen by John to kill Mildred. And um, so we are very honored today to be able to have in the midst Sister Mildred Mohammed. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? We are doing good. <laughs> We're so grateful to have you. Thank and we you. want to really get into uh, what you went through. But as you may know, here on the um, Let's Talk program, mm -hmm. we know that you're now a international speaker, yes, that uh, you are a writer. Mm -hmm. But look, baby, no here, <laughs> <laughs> no matter how many PhDs you have, how many places <laughs> in the country you've been, the vital question is, what high school did you go to? And do you remember your alma mater? I remember, uh, I went to Scholarville. Oh, was, you went to Scholarville. Yes, yeah, and when, did you go to Scholarville, the magnet school? No, ma'am. Where, well, where, where the, the magnet schools <laughs> when I was in school? Okay, what was it when in your name? Scholarville High School. Period. And what was your, uh, um, you know, mascot? The Hornets. The Hornets. Oh, you okay? You were there in the black and gold. Black and gold era. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now that other important question: Do you remember your <laughs> alma mater? Vaguely. V <laughs> Vaguely. Well, Vague. let me tell you this. Um, okay. Of course, I went to Capitol. The oh, home no, of the mighty, that's mighty rival, Lions. That's a rival. That's a rival. <laughs> and you know what we said all the time about Scotlandville Hornets? What's that? You guys had, uh, and wait, wait, now wait, I got to, I have to go back to uh, Sister Alicia. Okay. But just before I get bombarded <laughs> uh, on both sides, I just got to tell you this. Okay. You all had your own football field. That's right. We had to rent. Yes, oh, man. We had to go to another Memorial place to, to play y'all. Yes, ma'am. Where they still, they got to rent. You know, we they didn't ever be in that They still don't We still renting. We ain't never been oh, no home really? homeless, but that's all right. <laughs> we were in the poorest <laughs> part. As long as they get we're to in play. the poorest part of Baton Rouge. <laughs> We just had a practice field. We didn't have no stands. Okay. So, <laughs> but this is what they said about Scotlandville. All the football players said that. Okay. They said that Scotlandville football field was full of ant mounds. <laughs> and since well, they practiced. I was on the sideline. Hold on. Hold on. I was on the sideline as a cheerleader. I don't know what the field was like. Let me tell. I got to finish spreading this room. Yes, ma'am. 
40 years later. Okay. <laughs> but <laughs> they practiced on the field, so they knew where all the anthills were. Right. And that they always tackled the uh, opposing team folk into the ant mounds. Right. So that they would get. <laughs> they would get eaten by the ants. Yeah. <laughs> For the whole game, they was trying to get ants off of them. <laughs> and that's how Scotlandville won most of their games. Oh, oh, oh so the ants helped us to win. Is that what you're saying? Uh, the strategy <laughs> was that they had dim lighting and many ant mounds, which they seem to cultivate. Wow. In order to make a home game win. <laughs> I will not submit to that. We won because we won. It had nothing uh, to do with the ants. It had nothing to do with the ants. I'm just saying. <laughs> I'm just saying. And if you now, I'm, look, I gotta let uh, Alicia here in here on this. Okay, uh, Alicia. Yes, my dear. <laughs> my Where'd dear, where'd you go to high school? I went to Baker High. <laughs> The buffaloes. Thank you. Now here I am, a lion, surrounded by buffaloes, <laughs> hornets, <laughs> and the infamous ant mounds. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you have heard the ant mound story, I have not. You <laughs> I have not. I just know we won. We won. We won. That's it. That was it. We we came to play. And we won. Period. And yeah, That's you all I know. There was <laughs> trick in the book. <laughs> there were no tricks. We just won. <laughs> Let, I want anybody that know about it, please text about no, that. Um, no, we just that won. That hornet strategy of using there was no other strategy. We tricks. just won. We just won. Ivory went to Scotlandville. He oh, and when she says Ivory, she's talking about Ivory D. Payne, the originator of 247PraiseRadio.com, which was a classmate of Sister Mil Mildred Muhammad. And back in the day, before he became publisher of the Baton Rouge Weekly Press, and before he became president of the Louisiana Black Publishers Association. Okay, Sadly, he on. was a hornet. Absolutely. That's, that's not and sadly. The what? Of a hornet. <laughs> His he mama like was a hornet. Like he, <laughs> he come from a long line of hornets. <laughs> <laughs> And this is what I must contend with here in Baton Rouge. Today, at least today. <laughs> You're tuned to Let's Talk. I'm your host, Stephanie Anthony. We have uh, uh, live Mildred Muhammad. Mm -hmm. And of course, on the phone line, we've got our very own Alicia Gard. I began by letting you know that uh, Mildred, although beautiful got a big old smile and all of that she's been through. and a hornet and a hornet and, oh god <laughs> somebody send me a meme with a hornet so what a meme mean mean no. don't send me no school cute stuff send me a meme one of you artists make me a uh uh what do you call an ant mound and poor helpless victims being <laughs> stung by hornets and bitten by ants while they no, tried we to won play. fair and square we won we won we won we won <laughs> oh goodness <laughs> anyway y'all know what i'm talking about Yes, if you yes. got, you know, they were, Scotlandville was uh, one of our rivals, the mm -hmm. big rivals. Of course, this was uh, before uh, integration. Okay. The big rivals were Capital, Scotlandville, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. of course, McKinley. McKinley, yep. <laughs> yeah. It was the, that was the big. That was the big three. 
Aim for the big three. <laughs> yes, ma'am. And uh, them buffaloes, I don't know. I don't know when they yeah. start letting black people in up there. But <laughs> <laughs> in 1977, girl, it was just a good year, you know. We we got along well, but baby, baby, that's where Roots came. You know, Roots started the first time I saw Roots. Sure did. I was, I was in I was in high school. I was in uh, Scotlandville when Roots yes, first baby. came out. I sure yeah, was. We're not going to be- he was gonna say his name. A name, <laughs> a name is important. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yes, I remember that. <laughs> yes, indeed, baby. We love. Listen. <clears throat> There are a lot of things we don't have in common as buffaloes, hornets, right. and lions. <laughs> but one thing that we do have in common is motherhood. Correct. And uh, <clears throat> as you heard Alicia talking about, you know, the sorrow that we have here in Baton Rouge uh, as mothers, uh, yeah. we realize that uh, at the center of your story, Oh, uh, and can we call you Mildred? Absolutely. All right. At at the center of that is mm-hmm. um your struggle mm-hmm. uh to keep your children safe. Yes. And ma'am. um and that's where I really uh want to focus. Okay. If, I mean this had this was uh, uh John was something the nation had never seen before. Correct. And you lived with him. Correct. And um, as I understand it, uh, he was very controlling. Mm -hmm. And at one point, he was able to finagle uh, your children outside of the United States. Correct. Uh, So can you tell us that now there are mothers throughout Mm -hmm. the nation who are having problems with their exes regarding their children correct and they think that they are that they are not strong enough that all is lost that the man has won uh but i think you have a story to tell in that regard well when i had gotten a restraining order from because john had threatened to kill me he said you have become my enemy and as my enemy i will kill you even with the restraining order, the courts feel that it is necessary for the father to be involved in the children's lives. So although I had a restraining order, I still had to go into a custody arrangement where he would have the children every other weekend. Visitation. Visitation. Without, with the restraining order, that meant that we needed to find a friend or someone who would pick the children up from me and take the children to him. And then when the weekend was over, bring them back to me. So the first weekend went fine. The second weekend was my mom's birthday and she wanted to go to Country Buffet. So he picked them up on Friday, told them they needed to be back on Sunday, which was the visitation time. Well, five o'clock came, there were no children. That friend who picked them up brought me a note with $2 in it and to give to my mom, which says, happy birthday, grandma, love Taliba, which was our baby girl. And I say, well, where's John? He said, you have to call him. At that time, we didn't have cell phones like we do now. Yes. And so we had pagers, so I'm blowing up his pager. He calls back at 7.35 p.m. and say, we're en route from Seattle will be there shortly. That was at 11 o'clock. I'm trying to figure out, well, first of all, why are you in Seattle? You're supposed to be across the street at Kmart getting clothes. No, what? That's why were... I saw my children. Wait, yes, where ma'am. were you? He was in Seattle taking the children to Seattle. He said, well, where were Seattle? I was in Tacoma, which is a 45 mile, 45 minute drive one way. So okay. he was supposed to be 15 minutes away at a store purchasing clothes for them. So when he said that, I got butterflies. I didn't go to bed, woke up the next morning, which was a Sunday trying to figure out, which was a Monday trying to figure out where they were. Yeah. I called the school thinking that maybe he took the children to school for me. Okay. When I got to the school, I called the school. They said, well, your children are not here. 
I called the school every day that week. I went by. Oh, he didn't bring them back, period. Period. They were gone. But I didn't, it didn't settle within me until Friday when I went to the school and they told me they weren't there. And she told me to go home and call the police. Well, on my way home, calling the police, my mom, who you may know her, my mom was waiting in the, in the door. And when she didn't see me with my children, she let out a scream. I had never heard my mother scream before. I ran to her before she could hit the ground. And she said, he took our babies. He took our babies. I say, I know, mom. She said, what are now we going to do? Ch- how three. many children did he take? Three. All three. And how old were they at that well, point? At that point, my son or our son was 10. Okay. Selena. My son's name is John. Selena was eight. Uh-huh. And Taliba was seven. So they were all elementary schoolers. All elementary school. Yes, ma'am. So you had, um, I had never heard of a lifetime restraining order before. I don't think they give those out anymore. Oh, they don't. I all right. But, lifetime restraining order. Yes, ma'am. Well, uh, uh, the, the restraining order would have protected me. You. But they but, included child uh, visitation in the order. So. He still had. He had his parental rights intact. Correct. <clears throat> and uh, when the system thought that he was going to pick them up, take them to the zoo, take them this place and that place and spend a little time over where he lived, he had a different idea. He did. And um, and I know this is not easy all these years later. It's easy, you know, because um, I'm from it. I can talk about it. I can tell you everything about it. I help my children and myself to heal. I can talk about this and never don't cry because God healed me. You know, I don't have any flashbacks or okay. it's not difficult for me to talk about it because I know that what I'm I'm saying may help somebody else may help them to to avoid the pitfalls I went through in order to get their children back because it was 18 months before I saw my children again. Whoa, 18 months. That's a year. A year and some change, six months. I didn't I didn't have any help. The people that I thought were out were my friends turned out to be people who came and checked on me and went back and told John what I was doing. He oh emptied the bank goodness. accounts. He t- told the landlord he wasn't paying the rent anymore, which left me and my mom desolate. My sister from Maryland came here to Tacoma to pick up my mom to bring her back to live with her in the D.C. area. I was signing for a package on Mother's Day, and I passed out. No. And I went, I, my mom called the ambulance and they took me to the hospital and they told me that I had lost three units of blood. So my body began to shut down. My cycle wouldn't go off. I was under that much stress. I had, I was only eating a slice of bread and crushed ice. Really? Because I felt like if I didn't eat, if my children wasn't eating, I couldn't eat. If my children wasn't sleeping, then I couldn't sleep. That's the mentality that I was going. I was trying to Think of where are they? Where could he possibly have taken them? And nobody helped me to find my children. The people that were around me, I had to completely cut them off because I didn't trust them anymore. They knew where they were and didn't tell me. I don't I don't know how you I don't know how to articulate that type of pain for for people to understand what it's like to lose three children. At one point, I even felt like I wasn't a mother. I thought that John would wait until they went to sleep and shoot them in the head. Oh, they now you're not gone. awake, holy. They were gone. He not hated as... me that much. There are many stories of fathers that yeah. hate the mother so much that they kill their children to punish the mother forever. 
that's a pain that never goes away when your children are killed and you're thinking, how could I have prevented this? But when law enforcement doesn't help you, when the family justice system is broken, when you're trying your best to dot every I and cross every T according to the law and nothing happens, then what do you do? I did everything I was supposed to do. I called everybody I was supposed to call. I even went to the governor of the state asking for help. They didn't help me. The, the school system wanted to put me in jail because my children were not in school. I had to go before the school board to explain to them why my children were not in school. And when I explained to them what happened, they said, well, when you find them, just make sure you bring them back to school. They was gonna put me in jail based upon the Becca bill. The Becca bill says that if you don't have your children in school, you can be arrested. And they were going to arrest me because my children are not in school. That wasn't my fault. Now, where were the children for 18 months? They were in Antigua. Where is that? Out of the country. Completely <laughs> out. When I where say out of the country, that is Antigua is under British rule. So it's like one of the islands. That's where he had them. Like um, Jamaica? Like Jamaica, but Jamaica is under, I think it's under United States. Okay. You know the Virgin Islands is under the United States. Okay. All of the islands are not under the United States. Did so when I say he took them out of the country, he took them out of the country. Now, uh, how was he able to do that? Is he? What was his connection with Antigua? There was no connection. He had a None. friend he just in Tacoma, it. Washington that helped him. He convinced the people that were around us that I did not want our children, that I was a, a terrible mother, that he was taking the children to, to save, save them. them from me. They believed that, gave him $5,000. Who gave him $5,000? His friends raised the money, gave him $5,000 put him in contact with someone in Antigua. So when he went there with the children, they were they were already set up to live there. They Everything was in place. And that is when he met Lee. Lee was looking for a father figure. Now, and I Lee, want you to stop right there um, um, because I need to do a little background. <laughs> Lee Malvo uh, was uh, once... When this killing spree began, originally, they thought it was uh, white folks in a white van. Ooh. Yes. Wow. And um, in the end, it was uh, John uh, Allen Muhammad and um, Malvo, who was a teenager. Correct. And many people... Uh, when the press revealed this, mm -hmm. uh, revealed that he was, uh, they made it seem like he, uh, Malvo was a, uh, a a child of yours by a previous relationship. No and man. that he was uh, wanting a father figure and that uh, John Allen mm -hmm. um, embraced him Mm -hmm. mentored him mm -hmm. and uh, became a father figure for mm -hmm. him because your previous relationship had dissolved. Yes, and this guy, yeah. you know, this young man <laughs> was in need of, um, you know, a, a friend and a mentor. Okay. But what you're saying is that uh, John Allen met Malvo outside of the United States. In Antigua. His in Antigua. mother was going from island to island looking for a job. And for whatever reason, she trusted Lee with John. John brought Lee back to where they were living and had Lee to be a big brother over our three children. That's how he came. Now, was he a citizen of the United States? John, yes. Uh, and our children were, but Lee was in Antigua. He was not a citizen of the United States. He was States. not. No, ma'am. Um, 
I got to make you go back just a bit yeah. because, um, you know, to, to shoot down 10 people, you don't know. <laughs> <laughs> now, I don't know what that, I don't know what that means, but okay, let's There's, go. You know, you know what I'm saying? That's not something that you hear about every day. Yes, ma'am. Um, you know, when you met, how you met this man? I was in, I met him in Louisiana. He wanted to be in the military. He was uh, in the reserve. He wanted to go to active military. Now, is, he, is he from Louisiana? Yes, ma'am. All right. I helped so, him to go active duty. And then once he was in Fort Lewis, then he sent for me and then we got married. Wait a minute now, y'all met at a high school dance? Where y'all oh, been? Years later, years later. Wasn't it high school? Years I later. I mean, you know what? You you were at a, a at a restaurant. You looked up. He looked at you across the. <laughs> I was know, at I was, I was at the store with my friend Valina Collins, and unfortunately, she's deceased uh, now. And I met her him through her. And so we went out on a date and we started dating. And then he wanted to go back into the military. He was on the, in the reserve. Mm -hmm. And I helped him to study to do that. And then once he left, he contacted me and asked me to come with him. And I did. Where did you go? Fort Lewis, Washington. D.C. State? State. All right. So there you are in Washington State. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's going about everyday life like normal people. Right. And then from there, we went to Germany. Germany. Well, we had John John Jr. in Tacoma, Washington. Then he got stationed in Germany. That's where we had Selena. Mm -hmm. And then we came back in 93, and that's when we had Taliba. And he got out of the military in April of 94. Now, what made the script flip, uh, switch for you to know that this is not the way you want to live. We had our own business, um, Express Car Truck Mechanic. It was a mobile auto repair service. Within that service, we would we had more women customers than men. We had businesses, um, police departments, all of that, because we were mobile. I was uh -huh. able to do contracts with the government and with the social services. However, he had um, was having multiple affairs and I told him that I wanted a divorce. And that's when he said, well, you know, if I can't have you, can't nobody have you. Oh my so goodness. He did, out. he did move out. We mm -hmm. did go through the divorce process and we were coming up to, but to the divorce process. But in the interim, he would come in in the middle of the night cause he still had a key to my, to the house. And he would, I could hear him walking down the hallway. He would come in, lean over to listen to me breathe, walk around the bed, and then leave out. He did that about three times. My daughter woke up the last time he did that. And he picked her up and gave it to me like he was supposed to be there. Then I noticed that my phone wasn't ringing. He, he called the phone company and had my phone number changed without my consent. So they and this was to cut you off from others, from everybody. Mm -hmm. And so he was already telling other people that I wasn't a good mother, that there was he needed to get away from me and things like that. Well, uh, were you guys still um, you uh, running the business together? Yes, ma'am. Okay. January of 1999, because he took the children in 2000. All right. March 20. Seventh, my mother's birthday, two thousand. He didn't bring her back, and my mother just started deteriorating. You may know the Burrell family. You know any Burrell family? I Burrell family. I, no, I think I know one Burrell. Okay, that's um, my cousin. That's my family. Decades. So right, my mother was uh, Olivia Green. Ah, okay. Mm -hmm. And so she spiraled downward because. Taliba was her favorite. All of them were her favorite, but she she was a grandmother without grandchildren. Without grandchildren, I was a mother and, without children. Yeah, and you guys didn't really know about 
uh, their safety. How did um, you finally get the children back? He, uh, you know, we have fast forwarded. He's, right. uh, you I got the divorce. Yeah, I was. And I you thought that was going to be the solution. He did. But he, no, there he, didn't he, know it. he didn't know <laughs> that we were divorced. Oh, because secret. <laughs> when I, when he took the children and I passed out, they took me to the hospital. He called the hospital. He had someone to call the hospital pretending to be someone else. And when I got on the phone, he said, how's mom? I said, she's fine. I said, why won't you let the children call me? He said, we don't always get what we want, do we? So he wanted me, since he already said, you have become my enemy. And as my enemy, I would kill you. I had two choices. I could either go back to him and die or hang up the phone and never see my children again. And I hung up the phone. The, the nurse called came in because I was screaming and I asked her, could they trace the call? They traced the call to a woman who called the hospital for him. My mother called shortly thereafter and said that John just called her and said he's on his way to kill her daughter. So they moved me out of one room, put me in another, took my name off of the register, posted a guard outside my door and anyone who was coming to see me needed to send up their ID so that they could let me see the picture since they didn't know what he looked like. A social worker came in and said, okay, so we need for you to do three things. One, change your name and make it a name that if someone calls you, you will respond. So my safe name is Millie. Two, you, we're gonna bring you different clothes because you can't dress the way you normally dress. Okay, number three, which was the hardest of all, is that I would have to disconnect from everybody that I knew. Nobody could know where I was going because they had to put me in hiding so that I would not be killed. So you were like in witness protection almost. Almost. So we waited till it got dark. They uh -huh. took me out the back door of the hospital and a car was waiting. They drove me all around the city, but they told me I needed to slouch down because they didn't want anybody to see me in the car. When actually the shelter they took me to was right across the street. So I lived in the shelter for eight months. In the shelter, I signed up for Professional Career Development Institute online courses because I wasn't getting any help and I needed to learn the law to get my children back. I was making straight A's in the shelter. The YWCA called and asked me to come and work with them. While I was working with them, I was in the courthouse. And that's when I said, I need to get my own paperwork straight. So I got my divorce October 6, 2000. I got a writ of habeas corpus that stated anywhere they found my children, they needed to pick them up and bring them back to me. And Washington State had just passed a law stating if you are a victim of domestic violence, you can leave the state without being charged with kidnapping and you do not have to tell your abuser where you're going. So I had all my paperwork intact. My sister called from Maryland and asked me to come and help with my mother, our mother, because she was sick. So that's when I came here. I know the media say she, she came over to the DC area. I fled <laughs> over here to take care of my mom. Um, and when I was here, I filed, I called the FBI and I told them that my children had been kidnapped and they brought over, they sent over an agent. I told him everything that happened and they say, well, um, I say my cousin who is a private investigator, he says when the trail runs cold, that means the people you're looking for are no longer in the country. He said, okay, Ms. Muhammad, what paperwork you got? Gave him all my paperwork, divorce decree, writ of habeas corpus, pictures of John and the children, and my restraining order. <clears throat> he sent me a, a letter a couple of weeks later, said, I'm sorry, there's nothing we can do. But we're going to see Because they were out of the country? Because they, there was nothing they could do. That's all they said. They didn't have any kind of extra. They didn't, they didn't try to just resolve no, it. They didn't anything. try. They didn't even try. They just sent me back my paperwork. <laughs> Say, tough. Go about your life. Forget them kids. Right. Which a lot of people were telling me to do. Snap out of it. Get back to work. 
at least your children are with their father. Why are you tripping? What, just go because back to work. You can have more children. That's what I was getting. No help whatsoever. He gave me a number to call the FBI agency in Seattle since he said this is an ongoing case, right? Yeah. So I called the FBI in Seattle and I told them everything that was happening. He said, well, Miss Muhammad, since we know he's looking for you, what we want to do is put you in the middle of a parking lot and use you as a decoy. This way we can lure him out. I well, said, excuse me. Wait. <laughs> excuse me. This is like a it's comedy. gonna be a headshot. You're not gonna know which way the bullet is coming from. He said, We just trying to help you out. Click. I hung up the phone. They at this so, point, they did not uh have any idea that. Okay. No. How dangerous. I was telling him though. I but was telling how him. did you know? He said, You I, have become my enemy. <laughs> and so, as my enemy, just I tell. will kill you. Some that was a just, direct threat. You believe I am me. not going to wait around to find out if he's actually going to do it. He was an 84 combat engineer. You remember what MacGyver was back in the day? That yeah. was John. He could make a weapon out of anything. He tell you he's going to kill you. He's going to do it. He tells you what he, he was a man of his word. He said he what he meant and he meant what he said. It was just a matter of time of how he was going to do it. I knew it was going to be a headshot because his motto was one shot, one kill to the head never leave an enemy behind. He already said you have become my enemy. So he was going to kill me and he was going to bury me somewhere where no one be able to find me. I, I, you didn't, I, I, I you, knew this. Look, your mama didn't raise <laughs> no fools. Here's, here's the problem. People don't believe victims when they come with that kind of language. Oh, he was just playing. Girl, you, he, he didn't even hit you. Well, no, he didn't hit me, but he emotionally, financially stalked me, made sure I had no finances. He gave me $50 for food to shop for my three children, myself and my mom. What can I buy for $50? That meant I couldn't eat. So I took it to a spiritual level. I'm fasting. Because when you're fasting, you don't get hungry, right? Because you're trying to connect with God. So the, the thought of hunger does not fill your mind or your body. You're able to just move along because you're getting high off of being spiritually lifted, right? So I started fasting. Okay. Now you so know that they could eat. So my, my children and my mom can eat. My son noticed. He said, Mom, why are you not eating? I say I'm fasting. He said, "You're gonna be the cleanest Muslim I ever seen." <laughs> you know, I, I want he to was mom. seven. He was seven, and he, he knew. Said, he knew. He said, "Mom, is it dad?" Oh. I mm. said, "Honey, I'm fasting." He yeah. said, "Well, can you just can you just eat a spoon of food, please? You've been fasting a long time." I ate a spoon of a, a spoon of food for him. I never then nor do I now speak badly to my children about their dad. You can call him whatever you want to call him, monster, whatever it is. You, I don't care what you call him. They call him dad, period. I told them that God saw fit to bring the three of you from the both of us. And I will never say anything badly about your dad. Your perception of him is your decision. How you look, feel about him is your decision. It is my job just to help you to heal and to be stronger as you get older. I want to do a sidebar with you uh, mm -hmm. because uh, you were a practicing Muslim family. And uh, divorce is rather rare uh, in Muslim families. 
In fact, I don't know if you've um, if you're familiar with it, but uh, Nia Long uh, did a movie called Muslim. I think I saw that. Yes, ma'am. And uh, it's about <clears throat> a Muslim family mm -hmm. that undergoes uh, divorce. Okay. And um, it was really, I don't know if there's another depiction of that in uh, popular media. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, when you, you said that you uh, did a divorce in which he, you didn't even let him know that well, he, he had, was, he had the children. There was no way to communicate with him. So I had to put it in a newspaper okay. to announce it. And he did not respond to it, which meant the, the divorce would go through. Now, in terms of being a Muslim or a Christian or, or a Jewish woman, scripture says, as long as his hands is in the hands of God, <laughs> then you are supposed to follow him. But once his hand come out of the hand of God, you are no longer obligated to be there. I am not, whether it is whatever religion you have, God did not intend for women to be abused. I just do not believe that. I believe that God in Ephesians 2, he said he created everyone to be a masterpiece. How can you be a masterpiece if you're being abused? That does not line up. So you, what, women, <clears throat> whatever religion you're in, you have to decide which way you want to go. God did not intend for anybody to be abused. And anybody that tell you that, you need to run away from them. Run I don't away. care what who they are pastor minister imam rabbi i don't care you need to run call the national hotline on domestic violence 800-799-7233 you are not to live a life of torture of abuse sexual assault child abuse, any type of trauma that pulls you away from the fruits of God, you need to leave. Find a way. To tell us that again. Find a way. National. Because what I did, the National Domestic Violence Hotline, hotline 800-799-7233. Three. 24 seven, someone is there to help you to find the resources in your area that you need. If you're not able to call, go to domestic shelters with the S dot org. Type in your city and your state and a list of resources in your area will be available to you to help you through this process. You, you are not alone. This abuse is not your fault. I don't care what you did, how he came home and the food wasn't ready, the house wasn't clean, the children wasn't where they were supposed to be, is not an excuse for abuse. He or she, because women can be abusers too, they are abusing you because they can. We always ask the, the a victim, why do you stay? But we never ask the abuser, why do you abuse? When you ask the victim, <clears throat> why do you stay? What you are actually saying is this, I am placing the total responsibility of the abuse in your relationship on you. Because all you got to do is leave. Where am I going? We're in a pandemic. Shelters are full. I can't come and stay with you because you don't want the drama following me, you, to your house. Right? So right. if you can ask me why do I stay, then you can find me a place to stay. You Let can make ask. sure I have the security. You can make sure my children are eating every single day. You can give me the transportation that I need to get to and from my job because you're that familiar with me 
to ask me who you don't know, why do I stay? But you scared to ask the abuser, why do you abuse? Why is that? Are you just as afraid of him as I am? Is that what it is? I have another um, sidebar for you. Yes, ma'am. Um, and um, this brings to mind uh, a female pastor hmm. who uh, was fleeing from her abusive husband. And she said that because she didn't have a black eye, bloody nose, uh, et cetera, that people, and because her husband appeared to be so soft spoken and the narcissist together, you know, that they, uh, everybody that she turned to for help kept uh, figuring that it wasn't that bad. Yes, so could you uh, address that, the um, the abuse without bruises? 80% of victims do not have physical scars to prove they are victims. 80%. That's a lot. So the person that you sit next to on the bus, on the train, in the church, in your car, your friend could very well be a victim. But because we minimize the one to eight seconds, because we say every nine, st statistics say every nine to 15 seconds, a woman is abused, right? But we don't talk about the one to eight seconds. The one to eight seconds is the verbal, the emotional, psychological, financial, stalking that lead up to the physical assault. So it's only when I have bruises that you will recognize that I'm abused. But even if I had the bruises, you're still not gonna help me. <laughs> so what, 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 what do I need? I mean, I'm stuck you, between a rock and a hard place. If I, if I got a black eye, what you gonna say? You need to put some makeup on girl. We don't need to see what's going on with you. What? You're not gonna, he's a good man. Why would you say something like that about him? He's the pastor of the church. Do you know how well we're, world renowned he is why would you go through these tactics to hurt a man like that why would you do that you need to go somewhere and sit down and be grateful for what you got because everybody don't have what you got you doggone right everybody ain't got what i got because he beat me at home thank you very much now here we are now here we are you were able to get your children back. Tell us how. Um, By the grace of God, I know. Absolutely. Absolutely. I was in, I was here. It was August the 30th. You say here, August in, the 30th. The, that's my birthday. Hey, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> On your birthday. <laughs> In Louisiana, a, a blessing appeared to me on your birthday. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> August the 30th of 2001, the executive director of the shelter I was living in called and said, Millie, I think we found your children. You need to call the police department in Bellingham, Washington, and send them all your paperwork. And I did that, fax and everything, called them. I talked to Detective McCarthy and he said, well, Miss Muhammad, you know, we're right on the border of Canada. And if you get across the border, then we don't, you know, we're not going to be able to find them. I said, I appreciate that information, but if you could just please go get my children, I would appreciate that too. August the 31st, 535 PM. He called and said, Miss Muhammad, we got your children. What? I was screaming and yelling and running in and out of the house. My brother-in-law said, what's going on? I said, you need to talk to him because I can't talk. <laughs> He put, he said, but you got to talk to him. Got on the phone. He said, would you like to talk to him? I hadn't heard their voices in 18 months. Wow. My daughter, Taliba, got on the phone. You know, I never experienced this, but you know, when um, you getting ready to put those pallets to shock people yeah, back yeah. to life, mm -hmm. <laughs> when she said, hey, mommy, that's what it felt like. Oh, that's what it felt Because it had like. been a year and six months. 18 months since I heard their voices. I thought they had forgotten about me. You know, all the things that you go through and man, where are my children? I can't find them. I don't feel like a mother. Do I even exist as a parent? And so I had to fly back to Tacoma, Washington for an emergency custody hearing. 
Where were they? Where did they find them exactly? John had gone. They was he in Bellingham, back. Washington. He was in Bellingham, Washington. So he brought he them went, back to the United States. Back to the United States and up to Bellingham, Washington. He went to social services and filed for food stamps and cash. At that time, it was an automatic red flag for a man to come in and request food stamps and cash. They told him he was approved, but he needed to come back the next day. And that's when they went and picked up the children and put them in CPS until I was able to come back what you call it, CPS? Child Protective Services. Okay. To go back to Tacoma, Washington for an emergency custody hearing. And so we in the courtroom and John said, Your Honor, she already knew where those children were. I was scared. I was, I was, I, know I was shaking were. like a leaf. I was terrified. And the judge said, since her paperwork is in perfect order and she did it pro se, which meant I did it myself she will get custody of the children. John said, Your Honor, you're telling me I wouldn't have, I want to be able to see my children again? He said, you have to go through the same process she went through. Case dismissed. So we waited until he left the courtroom, right? We're out in the, in the hallway. My attorney is in front of me and my, the person who I was with was on side of me. The advocate was on side of me. And so the courtroom, the hallway is behind me. So she's calling the attorney to find out where my children are. I feel a presence. I turn. It's John. I take off down the hallway. My attorney, my advocate, they looked at me. They looked at John and they ran too. We all ran down the hallway, ran around the corner. We looked back. John put his hand on the courtroom door, looked at me and said, gotcha. My attorney said, oh, hell no. We leaving out of here tonight. So waited, went down the back stairs to the police department, told them what happened. If we could go out their back door, they said, no, you got to go no. out the front door. You got to go out the front door just like everybody else. I'm being attacked in the courthouse and you telling me I got to go out the front door just like everybody now, else. Now, this is in Washington, Washington State. State. Yes, ma'am. Mm. So we get in the car. We drive over across the street to the Department of Health and Human Resources, and that's when I found saw my children. My son was trying to grow an afro, but he had a <laughs> so, he had a cough going. He had a I should have said, "Honey, I'm so glad to see you," but his pants were around his butt, and I said, "But we're not gonna have an issue with this, right?" Because I'm pulling up his pants. Uh -oh. Then my How daughter, old was he, then? he was eleven. Okay. My daughter was nine, and my my. Selena was nine and Taliba was eight. And so Taliba, Selena said, mom, you missed my birthday. I say, I know, honey, I'm, I'm going to make it up to you. I promise. And so we they flew were, out they of were happy to see you. Yes, ma'am. John wasn't. My son wasn't because he, he worked on him to make him hate. He was him. the oldest. He was the oldest. He was the boy. My daughter said, was like, mommy, I'm so glad you're here. We prayed for you to come. We prayed. We didn't know what was going on. I said, it's How okay. How did he mommy. treat them? He treated them well, but here's the thing. He's, he told them that he couldn't find me. Oh. But if he had found me, he would have killed me. <laughs> he told him. He you can't tell him that part, though. <laughs> he that part. Okay. He couldn't find me. They said, and, and he said, you wasn't looking for us. I said, really? I said, well, let me ask you this question. I said, so your dad changed your names. Oh, he did. Mm -hmm. So how could I find you? And they just looked at me. I couldn't find you. They, he took them out the country. And changed their names. And changed their names. But uh, do you know what made him come back? Money? <laughs> he was in Antigua, right? Right. And he was selling birth certificates, airline tickets, and passports to the citizens for $3,000. Police found out about it, locked him up. He breaks out of jail, get the children. <laughs> he broke out, <laughs> broke out of jail. Got the children and came back to the United States. Wow. And was free. 
but he still wanted to get you. Yes, ma'am. So when I got the children back, we flew back over here. I went in hiding. And then a few days later is when 9-11. So nobody could fly anywhere. You know, the world was in a, a turmoil about that. So let's fast forward a year later. Shootings start happening over here. What they, they tell us to look for two Caucasians in a white box truck. Yeah. So that's what we're looking for. And I'm looking for John. So okay. everybody that's, looking for two now people. Now you've got the children. Right. And we're in, I'm in and, hiding. And uh, you you are in hiding with I'm at my children. sisters. Yes, ma'am. Okay. I'm at my sisters. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're in hiding because he has told you inside the courtroom got you. Yes, ma'am. And but remember... Are you have become my enemy. That's right. That's right. Okay. So here you are. You're trying to rebuild a relationship with your children. Correct. But you're undercover. Right. And you're untrusting of the system in right. many ways because they failed you along the way. Now there was so some times. there was some uh rays of sunlight. Mm-hmm. But they were not emotionally supportive. You've been in shelters and mm -hmm. all of that. Now there's a, a where you live. Now you're now in the uh, uh, DC area. area. Yes, ma'am. And there's a rash of shootings, and people are saying, you know, be on the lookout. Mm -hmm. And uh, you're on the lookout for a couple of white guys in a white truck. And John. And John. Mm hmm. And one day, what happens? October 23rd, ATF and the FBI knock on my door and they asked me, when was the last time I'd seen John Muhammad? And my hands started sweating. I said, why are you asking me about John? Said, we tell, you know, we just want to know when was the last time you seen him. <clears throat> I said, an emergency custody hearing in 2001. They said, well, have you heard about any other shootings anywhere else? No, I haven't. I haven't heard of anything. They said, we need for you to come down to the police station. So I go down to the police station. They question me there. And then they say, well, Miss Muhammad, we're just going to have to tell you. We're going to name your ex-husband as the sniper. I say, what, John? They say, yes. But do you think he would do something like this? I raised my head and I looked in the corner and I said, yeah. They said, well, why would you think that? I said, we were watching a movie. And he said, I could take a small city, terrorize it, but they would think it would be a group of people and it would only be me. I asked, why would he do something like that? And he changed the subject. And then they said, well, Ms. Muhammad, didn't you know you were the target? I said, well, no, why would I think that? They said, well, there was a man down the street. He was shot six times. It took his laptop and $3,000. There was another man two miles away from you, Miss Muhammad. They shot him in the abdomen. Miss Muhammad, you were the target. Would you like to go into protective custody? I said, you gotta ask me that? They said, well, yeah, some people don't wanna go. I said, okay, have you caught him yet? No, ma'am. Do you know where he is? No, ma'am. And you still have to ask me. Yes, ma'am. Okay, yes, I wanna go and into so protective they were gonna, custody. They were gonna name him as the DC sniper uh, right. incognito. They didn't have no idea of where to apprehend him. No, not at that time. And did they know that um, that although you had gotten your children back, mm -hmm. that uh, Lee Malvo was with him? They didn't. So why? How did he come? Why did he come to the East Coast? He went to a father's rights group in Tacoma, Washington told them I kidnapped the children. They did not verify his story. They did a skip trace on me, found me in the DC area and told him. He went to his best friend and said, hey, I found Mildred, I'm going over there. He asked John, you're not gonna hurt her, are you? And he left. That's when he was killed people in Washington state to Nevada, to Louisiana, came up to New Jersey, got the car, came back down and started shooting people, right? When they he caught him. Actually, he had, did he actually know your location? He didn't have he my pinpoint. He knew I was in the DC area. 
Be okay. So he found me though and started okay. stalking me. He mm -hmm. he he found my my routine. He studied my routine and found me. So I was supposed to be number 15. And my coworker picked me up for work this particular day. And she said, you know, there's a dark colored Caprice or Impala outside your cul de sac. I said, oh, girl, don't worry about it. Let's just go to work. We passed by the car. A the the driver looked at us, but the passenger had a newspaper and held it up. I said, Did you see that? She said, Yeah, I called the police. They say, Can you describe the car? I said, It's a dark color Caprice or Impala with New Jersey plates, two African American males seated in the car. So he found me. He found mm. me. When I did testified they for me, when they, yes, they did. Okay. He was sleeping in a West rest stop, and that's when a um, they put out the license tag for the car, and a truck driver noticed the car and called it in, and that's how they caught him. But when they caught him, they had nothing to hold him on. They Just needed forty eight the hours. Forty eight hours. They needed to find something. That lifetime restraining order, the Tacoma mm -hmm. Police Department didn't put it in the NCIC, the National Crime Information Center. The, oh. the sheriff in Maryland at the time found my restraining order, put it in the NCIC, and that's why they held him. Because of my restraining order, they were able to hold him for violating the restraining order to build a case to take him the, to trial. I the, see. So that's shooting. what your restraining order took him off the street. Correct. And stop the killings. And stop the killings. Yes, ma'am. My restraining order. They don't tell you. They don't tell people that though. No. Know? And no, they, no. they wanted people to believe that it was two black men killing innocent people to put $10 million on a stolen credit card. No. $10 million on what that, kind of credit that card was, is that? That was what was, was, what was on the, the note. But the theory was, this was the prosecutor said, the theory was he was killing innocent people to cover up my murder so that he could come in as the grieving father and get custody of our children. So it was a domestic violence child custody issue. However, you can't get the death penalty for domestic violence. So they left that part out of the trial. The foreman said the reason why we gave him the death penalty is because we didn't want him to finish what he started, which was to kill Mildred Muhammad. They don't mm. tell y'all that part either. No. No. Did you attend the trial? I testified. Okay. And, and so... When they told me, when the prosecutor gave me the subpoena, I went online. <laughs> I was so scared. I went online. I looked for the courthouse. I found in the courtroom there was a door behind <laughs> the witness stand, right? Mm -hmm. And so when we went, when we went, they did the the security search and all that. And I said to the to the guy who with the wand, I said, so. Can I have two guards? He said, Miss Muhammad, we already got three guards in there. I said, but you know, you're getting to know John. I already know him. By the time you realize what he's done, he will have moved so fast to snap my neck. I'm terrified. He said, Miss Muhammad, they got guns. I said, but you and I know that those guns are on safety and you're not going to shoot somebody in a courtroom. Can you please just give me two more guards? And they did. Oh. They, one guard escorted me to the witness stand. And so they're questioning me. And John's attorney says, Your Honor, can we approach? I went, Oh, you know how close that, that, that witness stand is to the judge? The judge said, Wait a minute. He called two police officers up they and asked me to go stand in the corner where those two police officers protected me in case he got away to come over and hurt me right mm. so he's looking at me i'm looking at him because i'm not you are not gonna make me cry i'm not gonna be weak 
or appear to be weak so that you can win in this courtroom. Yeah. And one of the police officers saw that and stood in between us to block him from looking at me. And he turned around and he said, I got you. Don't worry really? about it. I got you. That's what the police officer said. I got you. Oh, Don't worry about okay. It. Yep. Well, <clears throat> well, he was convicted. He was convicted. And he, he was, was executed. In 2009. Right. The day before Veterans Day. Mm. They said they couldn't, they could not execute him on Veterans Day or the day after because he was a veteran. Oh. Right. Did he uh, ever, no, no communication, no words of regret? Nope. He didn't say anything. And um, and he had no last words before his execution itself. No, ma'am. Did you, um, you know, once he got the ultimate sentence, mm -hmm. did you feel, how did you feel? So when he said, you have become my enemy, and as my enemy, I will kill you. I severed every emotional tie I had to him because I had to think for myself. I could not be worried about his reactions, his thoughts, his words, because I was trying to save my own life. And as a victim of domestic violence, our emotions are intertwined with the abuser. So what we have to do is separate your emotions from the actual facts and start to think for yourself and you'll be able to move forward. As long as you are emotionally, emotionally attached, the concern is more about how the abuser is gonna feel about what I'm doing instead of me doing what I need to do for me. So when it came to the death sentence and the execution, I didn't feel anything because I had, I had been healed from that. I had been severed from that. I had, I had my closure through God. I was fine. My concern was my children. This is and daddy. This is daddy. Daddy is Right. By the time good, he was, said, they yeah. were teenagers. My son was in yeah, right. Louisiana Tech. I had to bring him home. I said, I, he said, Mom, I can handle it. I said, Well, oh, honey, I need, I'm going to bring you home. I'm, I'm going to bring you home. I'm going to bring you home. So, how are they now? They're great. They're, My son is they're so He's engaged. My daughter, Selena, is 29, I got to think, 30. <laughs> She's married. Oh. <laughs> and my daughter Taliba is will be 29. So she's 28. And she's in a, a very loving relationship. So they're all they're all great. And and and, and when, when we were here, the community, when I say people don't help you, the community didn't help me. You know what they said? Huh. They said if you would have stayed with him, he just would have killed you. Oh. If you would have stayed on the West Coast. Then the people on the East Coast will still be alive. Oh, they How figured that you, you call you and your children victims when none of you were hurt or killed. And how dare you bring this drama into this quiet community? Victim blaming to the highest for me. And my so, children said, well, Why you didn't tell us? I said, Because I had to take that hit. I was trying, I had to go to the library and get a book on counseling to learn how to counsel me and my children because the counselors in the area was trying to be famous. Lord, oh. no. they wanted to, oh, the DC children said this, the DC sniper's wife said that. No, you will not have that opportunity. I'm just gonna do this myself. <laughs> I'm gonna heal them myself. And there you go. You, um, you started to tell your own story. Right. And how did you first start? And um, I, I know I'm acting like I got your whole day. That's so I, I put out the whole time for you. I did. <laughs> All right. Because I know how my people are from Louisiana. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. I got you. I got you. I got you. 
<laughs> so we, I, um, I was having this dream about helping women and I, and I, I rolled off the sofa and onto the floor. I said, okay, Lord. All right. All right. Okay. 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 So I, I sat my children down. I said, look, I got to answer this calling <laughs> to help other women and men yeah. who are victims of domestic violence. But the only way I can do that is I got to talk about your dad. So I'm asking your permission. Can I do that? So you waited. Like, Mom, you as long as you tell the truth. Second. It was after the execution and yes. after. It was before that. Before. Before the execution. While you were trying to self um, heal. And heal my children. I was already speaking out about domestic violence. The, the you don't have to have physical scars to be a victim or a survivor of domestic violence. Here's the interesting thing. I was speaking at this first time I spoke, told, shared my story at the end, everybody's um, talking to everybody. And this elderly black woman, she had those canes that you, on your, on your wrists, you know, those yeah. metal things. Yeah, and she yeah. motioned me to come over to her. And she said, you know, I am just so proud of you. I said, Thank you so much. She said, I'm so glad you're speaking for us. I said, who's the us? She said, those of us who don't have physical scars. She said, can you make me a promise? I said, yes, ma'am. She said, promise me that no matter what, you will continue to share your story and speak for us. I said, yes, ma'am, I promise. Somebody tapped me on my shoulder. Now, this, this is stadium seating where the 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 table is at the bottom of the auditorium and you got to walk up to leave out. So someone tapped me on my shoulder. I turned to address them and I turned back. She was gone. Mm. Mm. I looked around. I ran up the stairs to look for her. Nothing. You don't know where she oh, came Lord. from. Or where she oh, came Lord. From. All right. <laughs> Okay, Lord, I, I, that was my angel. And that's your message. What do you want me to do? This is my purpose. So, hey, I'm on the dog on it. I, I gave my word that I would continue to speak, and that's what I'm doing. Now, when did you start writing? I and was it cathartic? Scared, silent. When the one you love becomes the one you fear. Aww. That was my. That's my book. I started writing someone of uh, the different organizations that I was speaking on at mm -hmm. said I need to write my story so that it could reach more people. And yeah. so that's what I did. So it's scary silent. I've written other books too. A uh, escape plan. Planning oh, my escape. Oh, planning my escape. Mm -hmm. Boy, some people need that. And also, because we're telling working in a pandemic. Teleworking, being abused while teleworking mm -hmm. during COVID nineteen coronavirus disease twenty nineteen, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of women who oh, are yes, ma'am. They don't, I wrote they it don't it. get out of the they don't they get can't. away at all. They can't. They can't. They don't. At that time, all of the shelters were closed. Police officers wasn't doing much. You can't. You couldn't leave to go anywhere. So yeah. that the the organizations all over the world found out they were not prepared for this. Mm -hmm. They were not prepared for the number of abuser um, victims that were dying more daily than they had all year. Said so mm -hmm. more women died. There were more deaths from domestic violence than there were soldiers that died in the Iraq War. Wow. Now here you are, 2020, yeah. 2022. 20 years since this took place. Yes, ma'am. And 20. you're still on the battlefield. Absolutely, because there are so many women that need help. I do what I, I have you seen changes for the better? It's getting worse. It's getting worse. The same things I was dealing with in twenty, in two thousand, are the same things I'm helping other women with now. How is that better? The, the VAWA Act has not been passed. <clears throat> it's sitting on the Senate's desk. Why? 
because they want to include restorative justice. Restorative justice says that I, as a victim, have to sit down with the abuser so that he can explain to me that I may have misunderstood or misinterpreted his acts of abuse so that we can come to a conclusion that he's not the monster. That, that sounds like some liberal mess, don't it? <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's what liberals going amok. <laughs> you know? <laughs> this is going from saving the victims to rescuing the abuser. That's what I call it. You're no, rescuing me... the abuser because, <laughs> you know, they just... This is what I say all the time. You know that um, many people... Uh, grow up in dysfunctional situations, mm -hmm. some of them horrendous. Yes. However, there's a whole spectrum of people that vow that they will not be like the people that abuse them. Right. And they bend over backwards to groom themselves, to mm -hmm. nurture themselves so that they don't become monsters. Right. And then there's a group of people that are, I can be a better monster than the one that ruined my life. I can <laughs> ruin <laughs> more lives <laughs> and right. I can co produce more terror right. than and those <laughs> who terrorize me. Correct. I, I'm glad you say correct because sometimes I say that and people be like, huh? <laughs> you know. no, that's you're absolutely correct. That's what they do because they can. And like I said, if you're in a if you're in a leadership position and you are admired by your community, nobody is going to believe you're an abuser. Nobody's going to believe you're a rapist. You know, they changed the the term rapist to sexual assault because the term rapist was too harsh on the rapist. So we say we say sexual we say sexual assault now so that you can feel better about what you're doing. But we're not gonna stop you. We just gonna make you feel better. <laughs> we're gonna give you a <laughs> gonna make you feel better <laughs> about what you're doing. That's how, you know, that's all we're doing. We're not we're not gonna really do we you know, we, we really not. You know, fifty-eight thousand children a year are taken from mothers and given over to documented fathers who will abuse, rape, sodomize their children, and then they have to give them back on the weekend. Where is the sanity in that? Court ordered. Mm -hmm. Where's the sanity? This, this Mildred, Yes, ma'am. Here we are. Mm -hmm. You've been through a lot. You've seen a lot. You've heard a lot from yes, other women around the nation. And I understand you're mm -hmm. international. Yes, ma'am. So around the world. Yes, ma'am. I know that there's no nutshell for this, but what words would you have for uh, a woman or man that finds themselves in the grips of abuse here in 2022? Okay. So number one, everybody don't know that they are in an abusive relationship. And so I always get the question of, well, how do you know? I mean, what, what are the signs? The signs are your gut. That's the sign. Your spirit tell you something ain't right. You start getting on the internet, looking up domestic violence, domestic abuse. Guess what? You're in, an, you're in a domestic abuse, abusive relationship, mm -hmm. right? So what I'm gonna ask you to do is this, get you a notepad, something that you write on, even in your phone, because, you know, the phone is our lifeline now. Create a folder in your phone. Name it something different. Document, 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 especially if you don't have physical scars, because what you're doing, you're building your case so that you can take it to the police department or your attorney in order for them to see there is a pattern of abuse. Even though you don't have the scars, you have to prove there's a pattern. Once they see the pattern, then they can do something. If you are being stalked, 
in some states, find out what it is in your area. In some places you have to have three documented, meaning I called the police, they gave me a police report or a number to, to document that this person is stopping me. You gotta have three of those before the police will do anything, mm -hmm. right? Document, mm -hmm. document, document. If you're trying to leave, Go to Walmart. Which is uh, sometimes the most dangerous time. Up to 75% of women who try to leave an abusive relationship are hurt or killed. We we had a glitch. Repeat right. that. Up to 75% of women who try to leave an abusive relationship are either hurt or killed. It takes seven times of leaving before you actually leave. When he said, you have become my enemy, and as my enemy, I will kill you, I was going the first time. <laughs> <laughs> you you believe that man. <laughs> All right. I'm not waiting around. You're like, I love me. <laughs> I know you got the skills. I, right. So I, I'm, not playing, I'm not playing around. And some of us, some victims, when they, they do try to leave, but his family will step in and say, well, he ain't that bad. Why you got to call the police? Right. Yeah. And when you call the police and when you get him arrested and you try to get justice for yourself, sometimes your own friends will say it ain't, wasn't that bad. Why you got to put the brother in jail? You know, you know how it is for a black man. Yeah. Right. And so those would be the same. What about Look, you? Oh, Sister Mildred, you got to let me say this. Yes, ma'am. Those would be the same ones throwing themselves in the casket. <laughs> you know, <laughs> ones that wouldn't give you a dollar. <laughs> you know, or they, let you use their cell phone. They told me, they said, um, you know, you ain't all that. How that man gonna travel all the way across country just to kill you? You ain't all that. Don't psych yourself. I said, well, he thought I was up. <laughs> I got to ask you this, and I know people ask you this all the time. Yes, ma'am. Do you, you know, do you, did you classify him as crazy? No, John wasn't crazy. Okay. John was smart, intelligent, articulate. He was a sergeant in the military. He was a MacGyver. Which is why I knew he was going to carry it out. No. Yeah. Right? They try to classify him, psychiatrist, psychologist, therapist, in a box. They say, oh, well, he, he had a mental issue. No, he didn't. Because if he would have used all of that strategy for good, you would have called him a genius. Uh, but because he used it for evil, then you're saying, oh, well, he was mentally ill. He wasn't mentally ill last year. He was on the mentally ill when he started killing people? No. He, was, no. He, was, he took his military career. What was his military career? He was a combat engineer. His job was to go into enemy territory, find exit routes, and leave quietly after he blew up bridges and roads. That's what he did. So that's how that worked out. All right. Uh, look, we just thank you so much for taking <laughs> out your time to bear your heart. Yes, your, uh, uh, your knowledge uh, with our audience. And we want to thank um, um, Ivory D. Payne. <laughs> thank you, Ivory. <laughs> <laughs> Bless his heart. And right. we also want to, um, if you have, uh, you've given us the contact information for the National um, Victims Hotline, uh, yes, but uh, if people want to find you or your books. You can um, go to MildredMuhammad.com, click on publications, and you can order my books from my website. I will autograph them and mail them back to you. All right. Thank you so much. Yes, ma'am. And Thank as you. you and and as you go around the country and around the world spreading mm -hmm. knowledge. Yes, we uh ask God's richest blessings upon you that you are strengthened each time you share 
and that you're able to leave a legacy that will go far beyond your lifetime. Yes, thank you so much. I received that blessing. I received that blessing. Thank you so much. I really enjoyed speaking to my classmate from another school. <laughs> uh, listen, I did not look. I, I talked so much. I didn't uh, let uh, Alicia back in to say a word. But, uh, but since she's a buffalo. Uh oh. <laughs> we're gonna let her say something uh-huh alicia unmute the phone sometimes alicia has a new phone and i tease her all the time <laughs> because she the, her fingers in that phone uh get all tied up mm -hmm. but uh, we, there she is there you go all right I, oh woman of god bless your phone Bless what God has just killed, how God has kept you and your children. Yes, ma'am. All of that in your life. I mean, it's like a, a stir book that they can't believe. I'm from that, right there at Crestworth is where I come from in my middle school. I went to Crestworth. Okay. <laughs> I went to Crestworth. <laughs> you did? I okay. did. Oh, my God. I did. It's I a small Harding, word. I went to Harding Elementary, then to Crestworth. Then to Scotlandville. Oh my God! Yeah, I went to Crestwood in '75. Look, y'all. <laughs> <laughs> I was at Scotlandville at that time. I graduated in '77. Bless you, my God. Which we bless you and keep you, God. I thank you for keeping her life, her children, oh God, for keeping her mind, oh God. Yeah. God, she can laugh at times, God, but you know what? In her quiet times. She feels and she goes through things in a quiet time. So, God, I'm asking you right now, God, in the quiet times, mm -hmm. in the times when no one else is around her, oh God, God, you seal and you protect her, God. You let people come to her with encouraging words, oh God. God, you let nobody come to her to discourage her, oh God. God, people, so many people are so misinformed about because the man is smarter, because the man has degrees. You ought to be ashamed. No, but shut up. If you don't know, shut up and mm -hmm. listen and learn. Mm -hmm. But Father, I thank you for Mildred, oh God. I thank you for her life, oh God. I thank you for the time that he, he has shared with us, God, and she poured mm -hmm. out, God. He poured mm -hmm. out information, oh God. God, to give you a blessing. God, not let her want for anything, oh God. Not let her want for anything, God. That keep a kid's mind safe and sound, oh God. Oh God, touch their minds, God. Let the mind that be in them be the mind that was in Christ Jesus, that was also in Christ Jesus. I thank you for music, God. Oh my God. Continue to just walk with God, sup with her, abide with oh God. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Thank you so much. <laughs> And listen, oh, what's your favorite dessert? Uh -oh. Strawberry cheesecake. Oh my goodness. <laughs> my goodness. <Ooh>. <laughs> <laughs> May you cake with strawberries me. all over with the strawberry syrup. That's me. That's me. <laughs> May your life be filled with non-calorie <laughs> cheesecake. <laughs> In the middle of the night. <laughs> in the middle of the night. <laughs> With a hot beverage. Coffee. <laughs> uh, not to create any rolls of fat. Oh, <laughs> but to soothe and just go all over you. With sweet Absolutely. pleasure. Yes, ma'am. I'm with you on that one for real. <laughs> Till next time. Yes, bye, bye bye. Bye bye. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, ma'am. Amen. Alicia, thank you so much. We'll see you again next time. And may all your blessings be, uh, may all your conversations be useful and may you be overflowed with blessings. Yes, bye bye. Same as with bye-bye. I love you. <laughs> love you. Thank you, Mildred. Bye-bye.